Hello, everybody. I'm Jo Hickey Hall. Welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. And this time I have a wonderful guest with me, Jeremy Hart, author and fellow folklore researcher. I'm particularly excited to speak to you, Jeremy. Um, I have come to see you speak a number of times as well, and it's always been fantastic. If ever you get a chance to go and see Jeremy, please do. Um, but you have just released fairy encounters in medieval England, which a lot of us have been very much looking forward to. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I've been able to read your your new book. I started following your work with Let's uh, Explore Fairy Traditions. And um, and it's one that I always say to people, you know, it's a classic, have it, have it on your shelves if you're interested in fairy experiences and, well, fairy folklore as a really great, you know, all rounder actually and an introduction to how we view these experiences. So I was very much looking forward to the release of, of this book because I am curious about how our perception of these encounters have have changed over time. And, um, you know, sometimes when we're delving back into the medieval uh, sources, uh, resources, you know, even when they have been translated, they still seem quite inaccessible unless you are, say, a medievalist or you're kind of really into this. And what I really like about this book is that the way, and you made a decision to write it, uh, you said, I've written as if things happened as they are. And and your, you know, your your kind of tone throughout the book, it's it's very, it's really witty, it's very entertaining, and it's extremely accessible for anybody that's interested in these kinds of experiences, whether they happened now or in medieval times. We've got a lot to learn from looking at those sources. So, um, yeah, I was interested in the fact that you you kind of at some point must have made that decision to to write things as if they had happened. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? I'd love to know about yeah. that. It's interesting that um, in a lot of books that I've done, looking back, language has been a running thread. Yeah. Uh, particularly avoiding the language of alienation. Um, the other more recent book, The Gypsy History, um, was actually, you know, a reverse decision there to, to adopt the language of the people I knew um, and, 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 and to in, impose that on a wider readership as, as a way almost the opposite of kind of going, this is other, you know, these are yeah. translations from a foreign country. Mm. In the case of the fairies, it's kind of reverse decision. Um, it's let's actually stop for a moment and, and give a sense of being there. I think one of the things that occurred to me, you know, as a, you know, a part-time medievalist, um, I live there a lot of the time. And it's only when you're having these kind of conversations in a bar that you realise that it feels very different when you're spending a lot of time dealing with particular individual people and knowing a bit about them. Um, as, as as to the kind of vague general model that people are going to have about history before a certain point. You know, the enormous difficult thing about past periods is adjusting yourself to what seems natural to the people you're amongst. That's why it's almost like an anthropological exercise. And you 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 know, it's, it's a bit like sitting at table and kind of going, OK, I'm going to eat this stuff. Nobody else around me thinks this is weird. Um, therefore, it is not weird. I'm going to adjust my settings. And presenting it in, you know, ordinary English was part of that. The other great difficulty is, is that you were wrestling all the time with the fact, not just that it's coming from you, you know, to you from other languages, but from the fact that there is a language hierarchy split, which doesn't exist in modern Europe. So that people who think, think in Latin, or, you know, the, the, the best grade. Um, I mean, it's interesting when I actually worked as a translator, that sometimes I was dealing with people like Ansel. I mean, Ansel was basically using Latin as his first language. If he told a story, he told a story in Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my guys, whom I have a lot more sympathy, are a bit like me struggling to, you know, do a reverse translation going, oh, my God, you know, like, what's the word for pack saddle? 
Yeah. Um, and they, therefore, in some respects, are closer to, to the vernacular. And you, you are trying to get at um, English, Welsh, bit of Gaelic, the stuff that this is coming from. That's it. And, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right. If you're kind of holding something at arm's length, yeah. you can't really get underneath it. And I think um, by by getting in there with the stories, it kind of must help you with the translation as well, because you're already kind of sensing things from their point of view. And with Latin, especially, I've found when I've looked up, you know, the odd thing when I've, I've been um, researching. And, uh, you know, there are different, there are different meanings for, for the words, and it can just completely change, um, you know, what, what, they're, what they're getting at. And so if you're already there, you know, that's going to help you, you're kind of being almost guided along a little bit, because you're, you're, you're in the crowd. <laughs> and yeah. you, you are, yeah, you are, you know, I, I, I think for a lot of my middle range clerical authors, writing Latin was was a bit like cooking in gloves. You know, you did all okay. the right things, but you had yeah. this sense of clumsiness mm -hmm. just because they couldn't reach for, for it. And, and it is quite clear also that um, you, they pulled items out. And fat Fauni is, is, is very popular just because it sounds Virgilian and Latinate and God knows what the hell it means. Uh, but it will translate a range of terms. And we know, obviously, from the, um, you know, the place name evidence that lots and lots of different words were being used, mm. um, presumably used in some kind of a context, all of which get steamrolled. Uh, well, yeah, I, and, and perhaps we can talk a little on that afterwards, because the second half of the book is about place names, and yeah. that gives you an insight into, you know, whether... Well, well, th there was a, an interesting part that you decided to... So most of... The names, or at least forty-three percent of them, were referring to to Puck, yeah. and so. But then uh, you had omitted um, Hob, which would have been maybe related to um, you know a, a name yeah. for for someone called Robin, and and Grim. So yeah, could you just talk a little about that? The merit of place names is they're statistical. Yeah. The disadvantage is like they're only statistical because you can't ask anybody what the hell's going on. So, I, when, you know, when I was actually in, involved in the collection exercise, I, I realised uh, you, you, you can cherry pick, you know, you can kind of pull out Hob Lane or Hob Pit and kind of go, well, that's definitely got to be about the Hob. Um, but when you're trying to prove things, which in, in some ways is what you're driving at, the beauty is that there I was actually hearing people's voices and of course, the problem is I was getting the story that went with them, whereas, you know, the other half of the book is, is the other way around. I've, I've got stories, yeah. um, but I'm, I'm struggling all the time, as, as the people were at the time. Um, I think there's a genuine difficulty quite often on, on the part of the people who are transmitting this. They kind of go, well, I have no idea what's going on, but this is, you know, how I, how I can best understand it. I mean, there's lots of issues about how much distance was there between a lot of these people. The most interesting stories are miracles, uh, and miracles are, are normally written by monks mm. because they're the custodians of the shrine. So, like, unlike the secular clergy, they've actually grown up in an isolated clerical environment all their lives. So they really don't know what's going on. And then they're confronted. What, what amused me were the cases like, like Ryan Burgess you know, who is obviously one hell of a tough cookie. Mm -hmm. uh, and, oh, you know, you, you see her turning up, making her way into um, St. St. Athel's Swiss China, Adili, kind of announcing, I am here to be cured. I'm going to lie down and go to sleep next to the altar. Wake me up when I'm better. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, certainly. And it's now, I would like to tell you about the background to my miraculous experience. Do you by any chance have parchment and paper ready? <laughs> I then, thank goodness you know, he did. The, the point is that she, she's um, elite. You know, she's from mm. a knightly family. Mm. And she can mm. probably basically pull rank on, on most of the months when she's in, in full flow. Whereas the yeah. other end, an awful lot of the, the, these people, I, I, one of the distinguishing features, these are, these are people on a hell of a long way down. I mean, the, um, the fisherman who gets blinded by a demonic wind mm. is landed by his mates. He's from the Isle of Wight. They know he's the nearest place to go is St. Swithin's at Winchester. They land him at Southampton and kind of go, Winchester, it's north. See if you can get there. 
he teams up. And, you know, this is ridiculous. This is almost like folk tale. You know, he teams up with two women. So like he, you know, he doesn't know where he's going, but they can ask people and see. But he'll help them along. The three of them hobble. You know, yeah, halfway three. through Hampshire, arrive at the shrine where there is probably some kind of pious mechanism for looking after people. Otherwise, everybody would have starved. Uh, you know, and 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 makes his way to his cure. But um, you know, he he is about as far down in terms of opportunity as you can get. Yes, yeah. And, and we... That that kind of situation. When, when when we're asking questions like, you know, why does the um, the experiential narrative from these people sound different, but you know, occasionally similar to the sort of stuff you're collecting? You know, these, mm. these people whose lives are so much closer to the edge. Well, this is it. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things there. I mean, shall we head into the tales themselves yeah, at this yeah. point? Because, I mean, that the young woman that you're referring to there in that in that first story, could you tell us the story of of you know of the various layers of her experiences there? Because it well, began when, when 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 we meet with her, um, the the family has had a bit of a knock. They've lost yeah. the nightly father. Her mum has actually remarried um, a burgess from Wallingford. So, I mean, Wallingford is, is, you know, it's got a large castle next to it. It is, you know, it's a well, well, well established town on, on the Thames Valley. Nevertheless, there's kind of a feeling that, you know, the good days are over. And then it's at that point which uh, she is visited um, by an imposing lady um, who, it's a, you know, inflicts illness on her, essentially. All of these stories begin with the supernatural inflicting illness, even if the same supernatural takes it away again. And says you must go and be healed at Ely. And between the lines, I'm I'm reading her mum says, like, yeah, we cannot afford Ely. You've got no idea what the household budget is like now that your father's dead. And Ryan Biker says, I have received this supernatural message. And the supernatural women, all women, keep on coming to her. And then, you know, at first the imposing lady um, strikes her and says, you know, you must. Then you've reached a point at which she comes back and says, I have been worried about you. And there's this interesting moment where she kind of goes, and I saved you from drinking the water that your mother put out for you. And that's like, OK. I mean, you know, there's something that, that hints at other stories we've got with, with the theme of, of not consuming or drinking in the other world. Yeah. Um, and then, like, the imposing lady suddenly splits stream-like into two characters. So there's a, a short, angry lady who's demanding that something be done about her and pushes a, 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 an iron nail into her head. And then the good lady, as she now is, comes back again, performs psychic surgery, takes the nail out again, heals her, but says, you must go to Ely and give thanks. Now, the giving thanks bit is, is all kind of standard miracle narrative, um, you know, something happens to you. Originally, most miracles happened at the shrine. And then eventually, people who, you know, have had an accident literally can't move. Prayers are said, and then the corollary to that is, well, instead of being healed at the shrine, you have to go and give thanks afterwards. So that's like standard teaching. But the version here is that although he's going to the shrine of a female saint, um, and although there is this holy sisterhood um, of Athelthruth and her sisters kind of scattered throughout East Anglia, um, nobody ever actually identifies themselves as being saintly. And of course, they behave in a deeply unsaintly fashion, as we would put it. So it's, you know, a folk narrative is being crafted onto the story that is being told at second or third hand around the Abbey. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the stories do involve people being struck on the head and, you know, yeah brains being taken out or brains being put back in and yeah it's uh it's an interesting way to look at how they may have been you know speaking about people after they've had experiences and how kind of lost they were for a while and then suddenly they are yeah. they are found again and you know throughout the stories you've got people talking about seeing fawns and kelpies there are women coming up from kind of marshes and and streams and attacking people there's a lot of attacking going on in these you've got little yeah. red men you've got shape-shifting seducers yeah. black dogs and and you know as you mentioned before a lot of these kinds of beings these otherworldly beings are still appearing now because i'm speaking to people who are having these experiences the difference is that it's very 
unusual for for anybody to be attacked. Sometimes there's a challenge and it's about kind of overcoming fears, but and people have been really shaken to the core with some of these experiences. But I haven't spoken to anyone who has actually been attacked. Yeah, what what do you think about that? What's going on in some of these stories? And of course, I know that we can't definitively say, but I just wonder if you had a sense, you know, by, well, by reading even, something. Even allowing for like closing time outside your local pub. You know, we live in a society where people spend less time beating the shit out of each other. Mm. Um the, the there's two two sides with the violence and the madness. Right. Um, I think certainly there's a lot more social expectation of, of violence, apart from anything else, as a kind of class-based encounter. Mm. Um, you know, it, it was assumed that, that you know servants would get knocked about and so on. Um, obviously, you know, the, well, the, the gender version. I mean, there's. Um, Reginald of Durham's got, got, got one miracle where, you know, a woman keeps on getting knocked down by a spirit while she's doing the housework. Mm. And bits of me are kind of going, quite sure that was a spirit. You must be falling over and knocking your head on the fender, madam. Mm. Um, but uh, you, know, the, you you interpret. I mean, one, one of the things I did train myself out of doing was trying to work out what the hell was ever going on. Um, precisely because if, you, you know... Lots of people have done it. I mean, if you take narratives like The Green Children of Woolpit, which is like one yes. of those, those classic stories, there's a whole industry in kind of pouncing on this narrative and going, well, really, what was going on was X, two kids suffering from chlorosis, a couple of Flemings who landed in East Anglia and didn't speak English and so on. And you're going, we can get away with that with one text. But, but you know, sit down and work on the miracles of Thomas of Canterbury. You know, there, there's like two collections of about 300 miracles each. You know, and by the time you've reached page 10, you were going to have given up entirely on going, well, what was really wrong with them was X. And yeah, you yeah. have to go with the flow of your narrative if you're to talk about the history at all. Yes. Uh, a lot of those, uh, get, you know, coming into contact with, with those beings was when they were out sort of on the road somewhere as well, which, of course, yeah. in those times was dangerous to be travelling. And you note yeah. that a lot of people, even people with, you know, much less um, access to resources would have been riding on a horse purely because it was just so dangerous to be on foot. Uh, there's a couple of instances where people do, for whatever reason, have to go on foot or decide to go part way on foot and then and then get attacked. So there's there's all of that too. But the um wool pit, yeah. this is a really interesting case because yeah. I think what is very compelling for me is to read William of Newburgh's, you know, he he's saying, look, I can't quite get my head around this. But I can't not tell you about it because I've had so many kind of weighty testimonies from and from reliable witnesses. What I think he says, uh, yeah, yeah, weighted testament testimony of reliable witnesses. So, you know, this is something that he felt he had to to write down, and a lot of the well, the, the witnesses were still around when he was writing this. So, yeah, what what do you make of of that story? I think William, he's more intelligent for his job. Um, you know, he, he's, he's sitting, you know, in, in, in you know, the, you know, Augustinians. Yeah, you know, it's a nice job. Um, it's not near any intellectual heartlands. I mean, he's in the diocese of York, but not near York. Mm. Um, somebody says to him, "Well, you know, we could really do with having a history because, like, you know, you, you, you're interested in this stuff." And they, what they haven't realised that they're tackling somebody who has actually got a discriminating mind based on, well, the two categories. You see, because we tend to prioritise history because, like, it's still going. Mm. We don't prioritise theology quite so much. Um, we don't prioritise law in the same way. But for, the for you know, the 12th century, those were the two, you know, disciplines which made you think and, and weigh evidence. Mm. But they, they actually come up against somebody who is used to doing that, and, and not just about the supernatural narratives, although that kind of sticks out a bit more. All through, he's actually going, well, is this actually consistent with how the world is? But is it consistent with how the evidence is? And if the evidence is not how I think the world is, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to shrug my shoulders and hand it over to you. 
Um, where, whereas a lot of his contemporaries just kind of go, yada, yada, a dragon in Sudbury, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a reputable knight once told me, and and you know they're they're, they're just happy to write another story. Yes, yeah, and, and of course we've got the the other uh, testimony from Ralph de Coggleshaw yeah. as well. So yeah. you know it's really unusual to get. Yeah, Ralph is a lot more casual about it. Yeah, he's local yeah. though, isn't he's local he? Local as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a great story. Uh, I. You know, I, I think about William and what makes me laugh is, you know, we talk about people now with their their boggle thresholds yeah. and the way, you know, you, you look at a an event or you hear a story and, and you just can't quite get your head around it. And it just feels like, you know, that the um, the children of Woolpit really came up against mm -hmm. William's boggle threshold there. But the, the other interesting aspect to that story, I feel, is, well, there are there are many. And for people people that don't know the story, would you like to just give a quick overview of the story? Oh, my, 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 my first welcome duty is to recommend John Clark's book. Um, oh, yes. Yes. So you've published with University, University of Exeter, Exeter. Yeah. Press. Mm -hmm. And and here's, so there's three books. There's yourself and Simon's book that's just yeah. been released as well, which, yeah, I really want to get my hands on this. And um, the the children of, of Woolpit, is, it's, a, it's a fantastic exploration of the entire, the entire event. And he's really looked through all of the, the Latin, you know, sources again. And um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to reading that. So, so yes, please, if you could. Yeah, it's presented to us very close to the original testimony um, in the summertime, in the harvest time. We're, we're combining the two accounts here because what happened clearly is that from Essex to Suffolk, letters were circulated, which were pretty close to testimony as taken down. Mm -hmm. um, Two children are found at the edge of a pit or a ditch, probably a pit on the outskirts of the village by harvesters. Um, and the children are green, and this green is seriously unusual. As John points out, it's um, the term used is proscenum, which is basically leek green. So yes. they're not just feeling a little bit pale that afternoon. Yeah. Um, can't speak English or anything else that's spoken in Suffolk villages. Um, are taken um, to the house of the nearby knight. Um, and Sir Richard, you know, interrogates and gets no sense out of them. Um, they won't eat. They don't, they don't recognise, again, you know, the anthropological element. They don't recognise anything people eat in Suffolk as food. Okay. Um, until some beans are brought in. They throw themselves on the beans, split down the stems, and then burst into tears again because they don't find anything. And somebody kind of gently takes out the pods. The, these are like raw beans, the only beans there are there. Um, and opens them up and shows them this is where the beans are. They gorge on the beans and eat nothing else and survive on them until the boy dies. He, he was sickly from the beginning. But the girl starts eating local food, takes on the local colour, and it en ends up, you know, as, as like the ex-green girl. Um, goes and marries a guy from King's Lynn and just melts. You know. so, so clearly, I mean, the, the, you know, if only we could get the genealogical stuff far okay. back enough. Yes. I know. Yes. This is it. This just is there. It. She melts melts into the background. Exactly. Um, again, this is one of those um the translation exercise that that um William's version, no Ralph's version, we, 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 William ad adapts Ralph's text for a bit of this. Um but Ralph's version is but very petulant and wanton. Yes. In the standard translation, which I think even um uh, you, you know you've uh, Francis Young uses in his Suffolk Fairy Law book. Yeah. And I'm like kind of going, that's not like stuff that you're going to find online when somebody's describing their next door neighbour, are they? I, I, I agree. And, and also, it, it, you know, there, there's a, how do you, how do you work with something like that? I, mean, I, I think, you know, because I'm kind of going, actually, if I was dealing with a kid who had had a stressful experience as a child and had like put it behind her and was now a teenager, early 20s, that's exactly the behaviour I would expect. Not only that, but the Latin can also mean playful yes. and free. Yes. And so to me, if, you've, if you're talking about, you know, other, yeah. and if they were from another world and 
or wherever they were from, it is very unusual that they couldn't eat, you know, say bread. I'm sure they would have been given all of the sorts of things, you know, bread, yeah. eggs, whatever, to try and, you know, to not be able to recognize any of that is very strange. So, you know, very otherworldly. But if you've got somebody coming from somewhere else that is so terribly different and they come into our society with its ridiculous, you know, hierarchies, particularly then when you think about, you know, the class structures and 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 society, then if you are, you know, completely free of that, of that kind of of that mindset, then and we're behaving in a way as if all of that were nonsense, say for instance, then you would be regarded as free and uh playful. So and I think that's quite the, interesting. I mean the interesting thing there is that is the same threat, though less vividly um first hand that you get from Gerald of Wales when he's describing Simon the Demon Stewart. Because oh. again, of course, Gerald is, is, and Gerald is getting this from the stack poles that, that Simon worked for. Um, and they're kind of going, yeah, I don't know where he came from. You know, red-headed, red-headed, like, rings bells immediately. This is how the storytelling is supposed to work. Right. But, you know, we, we, we took him on because he seemed to, you know, know, know the business. And it was like, mm, it was, yes. You know, very, very reliable, but he was like terribly casual with the servants. He didn't seem to have any distance from them. You're like, going, yep, guy from another world. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, and, and like, you know, didn't, you know, a, a, you know, didn't really bother about the money. And it's like, yep, guy who comes from a place where you can turn stuff into gold if you like, you know, it's not really terribly bothered about hoarding things. I know it, it is, it is a fascinating you know, example um, and and a very rare one because of because mm. of all these reasons that you know all of the evidence and and these little, you know, the, these little aspects of the case that are so intriguing and the fact that we've got several witnesses and I think about the um, the opening of the beans as well yeah. <clears throat> and the fact that they went for the stalks. Yes. Well, that's what that's that's where you know, plants get their sustenance is through mm. the stalk, not from the bean. So as human beings, we go for the for what's produced. Yeah. But but in nature, we go, the sustenance comes from the stalk, doesn't it? Yeah. So I think about, you know, them were they an aspect of nature? It just for me, it kind of ties them into being an aspect of nature. But we will never know. <laughs> it is a great case. Uh some of the other stories that you you share could you talk a little about Richard of Sunderland oh Richard yes um this is not because the green children have been in, in the repertoire as it were you know mm. since the 19th century um, yeah the, the um the the miracles that Richard of Sunderland in a, a very minor manuscript that somebody kind of you know fell across and went oh mm. you know and ju- just translated for the benefit of local historians so the narrative that emerges there it's, um, from the well the Northumberland coast and um, you can see Farn Island from where it happens oh wow um, yeah so you, you can you can spot it on the map basically because we know where he lives and we know that he went down to cut some reeds well there's only one road that takes you down to a marsh yeah. you can go there if you like there he is um working presumably early in the morning early in the morning is another of these dodgy times mm. Oh, yeah. um, and and people people miss that now because everybody now kind of has midnight you know stamped on their brain you know midnight and full moon uh, because everybody's got a watch so they know when midnight is nobody in the middle ages knows when midnight is apart from a few professional astronomers because you can't tell by looking at the sky except by technical so uh, whereas midday everybody recognizes because you look up at the sky and kind of go okay you know time for a break or whatever uh, and of course, that that first light in the morning when people are out and about, because this is Northumberland, so you have to wake up early in the darkness for most of the year. Yeah, he's out in that, and so when he first sees them, he probably can't actually see there's anything unusual about him. There's just three guys riding towards him, uh, and again, classing, he stops, bows politely. He's obviously quite young from the force of the story, mm. um, and the three riders turn out to be green, and on green horses. The green horses thing. We've had an interesting comment. Um, Melworth in, in um, Welsh poetry, uh, one, one of one of the, the, the other worldly heroes, is also riding a green horse. Oh. So, so is, of course, the green knight in Gawain and the green knight. Yeah. It gets around. I think it's not just green horse. Um, it's riding a horse of the same colour as yourself. 
Oh, I see. Like white, yeah. like a white horse. Yeah. With like like white, yeah. Mm. Um, and you you actually have red men on red horses yeah. um, in the structure of the Durgas Hospital. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. kind of thinks it's a bit of the addressing politely. And then one of them just picks him up. And obviously there's a sense, again, this is where these things require close reading, like picks him up and puts him on it, like he obviously reaches down supernaturally and just picks him up like a weight. Mm. And off they take him. And then it says, and then a valley opens up. And I'm kind of going, okay, that's the point at which I would expect them to go into a hill. Mm. But um, Marie de France in, in the Lay of Yonac, I think, has a very similar version that you're traveling to the other world through valleys. Wow. And of course, back to my place names again, I went back looking at valleys with a, you know, an alert eye. To, and then to another world. So they're obviously taking him to wherever it is they come from. Mm-hmm. It has a king, which is virtually the only reference to this in the medieval material, you know, the medieval experiential stuff. The people live in a state of endless holiday. They're very big on inviting him to join them. And they give him a horn um, full of green liquid, green horn, uh, which he, and this is a great bit, having heard stories of that type before, yes. um, knows to refuse. So they're like kind of, you know, come join us, be one of us. And he's like, no. And, I, you know, at this point in the relationship, and they turn quite nasty and like, why should you turn down the opportunity of endless pleasure? And, you know, he's like, no. And they chuck him out, having inflicted him with um, dumbness, which dumb, dumbness and madness are basically interchangeable in this, this repertoire. Mm-hmm. Right, you're, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. you're removed from sociability. Um, and then at that point, you know, obviously at that point, and of course the question is how the hell does anybody know what happened to him given that he's done? Mm, mm. Uh, he is brought back by St. Bartholomew Farm who knew a thing or two about demons. And it's then that we get the story from him. Yes. But the whole thing, it just sticks out because that's a classic, what, what you know, in my earlier book I would have said was definitely much of a fairy tradition. Um, although the guy is there and he's telling the story, um, he's couching it in the form of a folk narrative, which obviously comes from a whole tradition of storytelling, but which just sticks out. You know, like there must have been antecedent stories. We don't know of any of them. We only have fleeting bits. And, you know, compared to the sort of archives that you work from in the 19th century, you know, where you go into, you know, the research room at Dublin and somebody kind of wearily points you to 250 volumes of book, you know, <laughs> collect tenure on Irish folklore and kind of guess which fairy legend would you like? From the whole of Europe, we've got these very scattered bits. You know, we have one stolen cup story and William, you know, we've got one story of, nor- normally, interestingly, in the, the later versions, um, a friend amongst the fairies cautions you not to drink from the horn and yes. you're about to do it innocently. Uh, and I, I don't know whether that just got left out or, or whether, you know, the other bit, you, you hadn't entered it yet. Yeah, You've yeah. got um, stories in Thomas of Contemporary, so from like Belgian border, which contain abduction folk tales in, in which a girl is retrieved from the other world by a man who thinks she's dead, carries her off, takes her back to the parents, can't go, and I'm terribly sorry about your daughter. And then, you know, she, she, she revives and marries him, which reappears very much as an Irish tale time. But then we've got one like bizarre early Irish experiential story sticking out, um, probably 10th century, in which a man is out shooting birds and a girl falls out of the sky. Um, and he, you know, he takes her away, thinking again, you know, he's got the dead girl, but she revives again and says, Thank heavens he rescued me, otherwise I would never have been in this world. And that, wow. yeah, because yeah, one, one of the tussles, it, it, it amuses me. If you want to write a book on fairies, mm. um, it depends which audience you write. If you want to write an academic book on fairies, Diane Perkins does it, I think, about chapter two or three. You know, she has a lot of fun going, fairies are not Celtic. Mm-hmm. And you're like kind of going, yeah, yeah, okay, right. No, I, you know, I, I know where you're coming from. There's a Scandinavian material. Is this and was not European? But when people say Celtic in this context, basically what they mean is Irish plus Scots Gaelic. And yes, our problem with the narratives, which lie alongside experience, is that the Irish have the earliest literature of it, Matthew yeah. or anybody else. And, and it contains the themes that will be there in, in um, 19th, 20th century folklore. 
you know, which are Eddie Lennon. This is still going on and still collecting. Very true. But what relationship this bears to experience is very tricky. Because I, I, I would love, you know, to be able to just kind of snap my fingers and kind of go, well, there were these things that happened to people. These are things that happened. And then there are the stories. But, you know, I had to draw on material like Richard of Sutherland simply because it, that contains so much that made sense of other stories. You know, the cup, the being carried off, the riders. Yeah. Um, no, I'm glad you did. Time, yeah. At, at the same time, you're thinking these things are happening in a world where the stories are known. And, of course, what what gives us the advantage of having a data set at all is that people who are healed are telling these stories. Yeah. And what happens to people who weren't healed? Anyway? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, England may, may have been full of people with mental difficulties, you know, wandering around and going, it was all because I was touched by the strange lady, and everybody in the village is going, yeah, we know. It happens to anybody who sleeps out at midsummer. I'm sorry, you're not going to get any better. Yeah. England may have been full of people who actually went around. We do have the one instance, um, the Clarks um, of Suffolk, um, where, you know, she's touched by the fairies again and her head twists around. Twists oh, yes. Head around. It's a big thing. Yeah, it was a mother uh, and daughter, wasn't it? Wasn't yes, it mother, mother and daughter, and... Agnes and Marion. Yeah. Agnes is the one who apparently has been like, you know, you know, her and the fairies are like that, you know. Um, and then suddenly something gets horribly wrong and they kind of go, mm, I'm not too happy with that, squelch and twist the head round backwards, mm. you know, and she's still quite young, she isn't married. Uh, so, so you know, she, you know, an old man comes in, presumably has to turn around and say hello, old man. Um, and, you know, in the way of a lot of people in healing stories, he's a young, an old man who comes from nowhere, gives advice on what to do um, and, and then says, you know, you are going to get better and you are going to have a wonderful daughter. Um, who, who is going to be, you know, the chosen one and, and, and the favourite of, of, the, of the saints and the fairies, who obviously, you know, in this Suffolk village are basically interchangeable people. Let, let's talk yeah. about that, because I wanted to ask you, you know, you have, so you have these people, you have the, the folk that live in the communities and the way that they talk about fairies, and then you yeah. have what the church is dictating and I think you mentioned that the the church disliked the kind of uncertainty that fairies yeah. brought with them yeah. and I thought that yeah that's really bang on and you know because because otherworldly beings they can curse but they can also bless yes. as yes. I would see it today too this is this is the way yeah. of the world it isn't black and white and um, you were talking about the way that if if the church are able to convince communities that it really is black and white or authorities are uh, able to convince communities that it is black and white, we can see the same thing happening today, then um, it's much easier for them to achieve a kind of border control between this world and the other realms. Yeah. Um, yeah could you talk about kind of when that framing might have started to take place with the church and, and fairies? Um, there's another book plug here, um, Richard First yeah. Green. Um, who's ah. up, you know, because you know, he is. I was fascinated by it. Um, he covers so much ground. In fact, he liberated me to write on experiences because I kind of felt that he, he, you know, dealt with so much of the, of the literary side. Yes. Um, but at Holy, the, Holy Friars, Holy yes, Holy Friars, um, Friars. Elf Queens, yeah. and Holy Friars. So, uh, Elf Queens and Holy Friars. Yeah, that's let, it. The good, yeah. let the good people have a look. Yep. Um, Fabulous. Yep. So. It's a very intelligent book, inside which, as I kind of reached the final pages, I thought there's a less intelligent book lurking in here, because it is about, you know, what we're talking about here, the imposition of a binary reality and the demonization of fairy. Um, and at the same time, I can see somebody walking away from it and kind of going, well, everybody used to have a lovely time hanging out with the fairies. And then the nasty monks and friars turned up and started spoiling everything. And you're like, again, it's it's playing to um, a perception for people who, you know, as it were, don't live there. Um, that there was there there was the Middle Ages, and, and there were people, and there were the church, and the church mm. would muck things up for people. You know, like kind of going little sense of how integrated the church and the people are. Not only in the sense that um, the whole social spectrum, from power to poverty is as represented in the church 
um, as it is in the laity. Um, you know, your 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 hermit kind of living in the hut by the bridge and surviving, you know, off the charitable donations of people going by. Um, it's not quite in the same league as you know your your bishop with an office of state and advising the king. Yeah. Um, and the church itself, precisely because it had its own internal power dynamics, was lousy as acting as an individual. Um, I, I'm a I also do local history. There's a hilarious account of, of what happens when the vicar of one of my local churches is told that he really ought to cough up and support the Battle of Bankburn. It hasn't been fought yet. I think he might have been a bit disappointed on the financial returns. Uh, but Edward II actually is, is imposing taxation. All the Edwards impose taxation on the churches mm. in order to pay for the expansion of scenes of the state. And I was, but both the mutes, because the guy did what anybody did. He just kind of dug his heels in and said, well, unfortunately, I can't find the grain here because I haven't collected my tyres yet. Okay. Um, but also the fact that the church, qua church, had no official position on this whatsoever. It was so integrated with society that when you did things in the Middle Ages, you simply assumed that the, the clerics and the laity would come along. So the church mm -hmm. doesn't act as an external agency in the way that, say, a governing elite does. And it is deeply involved with everybody at all levels, because the actual support for it is coming directly out of people's hands. What people want out of their local priest is a guy who is going to be holier than everybody else. Yeah. And, and they, they are deeply happy to do things that look from the outside extremely alienating. People pay um, to put up rude screens so that they can't see him perform the miracle of the mass. It's like, you know, and, you know, the laity are doing this. He, he's not kind of going, well, I want to be a special person. I want to be screened off from you. They're raising the funds because they want him to be special. But, of course, within the church, you've got essentially the cadre of mostly the, the higher-ranking monastic orders um, against um, the parish clergy. And you realise after a while, you know, they just looked on the parish clergy as being kind of, well, you know, they've got tonsure, but, you know, let's face it, often got wives until about 1,200, 1,300 in the north of England. Um, you know, they hang around, they go out farming. It's the, the attempt to actually produce a professional parish clergy doesn't get going until almost like at the end of my period. Yeah. So the people who are having the ideas... Um, the people who are pressing for, you know, a clearer sense of what the other world is are part of an intellectual movement, which is happening at the same time as Aquinas, and which is happening with the attempts to produce a disciplined narrative. And this goes in all sorts of weird directions, because one of the reasons why we have the details of demon lovers that we do in the late Middle Ages mm. is not coming from folklore. Is coming from theologians. They're kind of going, hey, hang on, they're spirits. Yeah, yeah, they're spirits. Like, you know, and he, and he raped me. He was a spirit. Madam, did you by any chance, um, you know, have any periods? Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here, here, you know, here is my baby. Look, it's got pointed ears. <laughs> Madam, I would like to point out that spirits cannot actually have intercourse with people because they're spirits. And then you get this like weird incubus succubus stuff, which is just worked up by clergy because they're having to try and make sense of what the folk are telling them. And they can't do it because it's crossing boundaries that they already have imposed. But then at the same time, the harshness, the, the, the you know, you may think he's quite a nice guy, but actually I am warning you, he's a demon. Do you know, break off your relationships with that nice young man who keeps appearing in your bedchamber? Mm -hmm. Um, is not purely clerical because that, that's part of you know an all round hardening of the late medieval mind. Um, relationships where there is you know, you, you get occasional embarrassing people like the guy who says, Yeah, 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 it's like a bit of a mixed neighborhood where I am. It's a couple of Saracens, they're 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 all right, apparently, they go off on Friday, a couple of Jews, they go off on Saturday, we all get on all right. It's like, what do you understand about Christendom, you idiot? <laughs> um, but that move is not necessarily clerically led. I mean, the expulsion of the Jews from England, because the Jews stand in a lot of ways for the other world. Some yeah. Countries. You know, um, this, this, this is what, uh, uh, you know, Agnes and Marion are, are quite clearly convinced that the secret treasure the fairies have revealed to them is going to be found in the Jews' house in Bury St. Evans. Right. Um, 
that the Jews were expelled by popular insistence, pushing both the elite in the sense of the king and the clergy to ch change tack on it. So, so there are all, all kinds of aspects. So, and one of the things I came away from, from reading um, Richard First Green was, well, yeah, but we're talking about violence here. You know, we're talking about fear. You know, quite a lot of people would prefer to have demonized fairies that they could actually, you know, exercise, as opposed to non-demonized tricksy fairies who they had to relate to. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is true. Yeah, that is a good point. Uh, and uh, Simon Young has written uh, a, a good book on the the figure of the wandering Jew as well. So I was interested in in kind of how that crosses over with otherworldliness and these these figures that may sort of disappear for apparently for centuries and then kind of reappear mm. as mm. these wise men, as you mentioned before, that kind of might step in and, and offer solutions or kind of yeah. enchantments, wisdom. The, the travelling wise man carries on in um, 17th, 18th century um, spa narratives. Uh, Matthew Chancellor received these re re revelations about how Glastonbury Holy Well was going to be curative, uh, you know, from travelling wise men. Mm. Yeah, it is. And of course, you, the, other, the other thing that you allow for is that um, unlike the later periods, there actually were elderly erudite men on the road because mm. you know, who, who else are the Franciscans? It, it was taken for granted that there would be this resource. So our kind of assumption that, you know, all the clever people, are, you know, have gone to university and have now got a nice house somewhere at the better end of the village doesn't transfer. Yeah. Um, a lot of clever people in the Middle Ages, you know, are, are, are actually begging at the doors of a lot of well-off but illiterate people. Yeah. Yeah, true. I I was interested to learn about um, some of the kind of sermons also um, mm. from sort of researching these sorts of areas that were used to have kind of collections of sermons that would then be passed around to other places saying, oh, you know, this one's quite good. This one's quite popular. So you would have yeah. these books where they could flick through and yeah. pick out, um, you know, as a, as a resource to, to read to the congregation. And some of them were very you know, threatening yeah. to the congregation about what it, you know, what it is that they were believing in. And, and you know, I know you, you mentioned the kind of, you were looking, your book looks at sort of between the 12th and 15th century. And you do mention their aggressive doctrines, but I still, I'm, I was still struck by the way that, you know, you've got kind of a uh, Council of Arles in the you know the mid fifth century. Mm. Then you've got Council of Tours in the um, the mid seventh uh, century, I think, or mid the, the following century, mid sixth century. And then you've got the Christian decrees being set down too. So every kind of hundred and fifty years or so, or at least of the evidence that we have, you've got you know, the church saying to the the bishops, you know, if there are people in your community seen venerating fountains, wells and stones, it's you that's going to be held responsible. And then, you know, in, in the end, in the Christian decree, they say to cast down the stones yeah. so that um, the community can't go and do what they're still continuing to do, despite all of these centuries mm. worth of decrees being set down. So I still, I yeah, I just... I would love someday for even more resources to be found just to tell us a bit more about, you know, the way that people, yeah, the way that, that people lived and the beliefs beliefs that they had. And I, I do hope that at some point more manuscripts come to light to kind of, to tell us about, to tell us about that in some yeah. kind of way. But I was kind of, that was very present with me as I was reading through your book is that you know these beliefs and these encounters and connections with the other world were continuing despite all of that and people making sense of it in their own way i mean obviously these have been written down usually by um holy you know holy men because they've gone into orders and they are there on on the scene to be able to you know be perhaps uh, one of the only few sort of literary people to be able to to write down this evidence for us so you, I know that you're always seeing it through that lens but nevertheless it's a it's a really interesting collection 
Do you find now that you're having written that and reading other folklore from from other centuries, do you find that you're kind of relating to it in a different way, having gone through those those encounters from medieval yeah. resources? I, I think there's an interesting methodological point here uh, between folklorists and historians. Um, the convergence is not yet perfect. Um, but I, I realised this because I was... Um, reading Carl Watkins, who's also a great guy, on you know, the medieval supernatural. And, but Carl, Carl is a documents man. You know, he's, he's a pro- 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 properly trained. So as far as he's concerned, you know, the text in front of him is the text in front of him. And, and you know, he reads it essentially through the eyes of the guy who wrote it down. So, you know, not, not my you know, concern about, you know, exhuming the, the, the vernacular original. Mm. Um, but also because of that, there's very much a sense that you don't fill in the gaps from other narratives. Whereas if you're working in folklore, your home ground is really these, I mean, England is anomalous in the sense that we have to actually go out and collect our stuff from scattered publications. Mm. You know, globally, a folklore collection usually consists of shelf after shelf or filing cabinet after filing cabinet of material which has been directly collected from people. And therefore, you, you just take it in the mass. You know, you, you start off with 100 versions of the changeling. And if, you know, if, if version number 32 happens to miss the detail of the brewing in eggshells, you just can't go, oh, well, it's deficient. Um, and when you find a bit of a story, you go, aha, um, yes, I know what they're saying here, except that they've understood it wrong. Now, instinctively, I prep the medieval material now with my kind of aha filter on, you know, going, you know, yes. You know, there, there's a little element here which is pointing me towards something. And I think we have Malakin. Um, That's oh, a great yeah, story. Let, let, let's bring Malakin in. Yeah, like. let's bring Malakin <laughs> in. <laughs> who, 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 who doesn't like a white clad chat <laughs> with the language skills of a one year old? You know, she was obviously a charmer. Mm. The fact that she was invisible was neither here nor there. Um, you know, she, she, she bobs up in the house of uh, the Daglingworths, isn't it? And at first, you know, they, they respond with that mild state of alarm you do when you hear voices chatting to you from the corner and there's nobody there. Um, but, um, you know, she talks to everybody. Um, in, in local vernacular, they, they do actually say, so, so obviously, you know, Ralph, Ralph and, and it's like Ralph probably is, doesn't quite have a sense of, um, you know, the English language. There, there's like Latin and there's what they talk in Sutton because she also talks Latin to the village priest mm. with the language skills of a one. Well, that's right. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the chaplain in their house. Yeah. Mm. Um, and tells people things about themselves. Mm, yes. So again, that's one of my kind of, aha, that's yeah. interesting. Because that's secrets. <laughs> elsewhere, <laughs> secrets. Um, but also, bizarrely, you know, simultaneously, you know, presents herself as a spirit, is only seen once by the servant girl, it's a little mm. white figure, um, says that she has a special cap which she puts on when she wants to make herself invisible, mm. as if she isn't, you know, oh, and her, her native state is, is, is physical or at any rate visible. Right. Says that she lives with her mother and brother, who are going to be tell out of her if they find out that she's been out fraternising with the humans. Okay, so mother and brother are not humans. And then also simultaneously um, says that she was stolen during harvest time. And of course, the harvest time, you know, it's a classic aha moment for a folklorist. We're going, yep, you know, there is a whole 19th nineteenth century corpus um, of babies being taken at harvest. Yeah. And the wool pit, the wool pit happened at harvest too. Harvest as well, yeah. Again, a kind of another inversion. Yeah, this is an <clears> inversion <throat> thing. One of the things that fascinating me about that because um it's interesting simon young and i corresponded about this right. and we both hit on the same literary reference mm-hmm. uh, which is bit in tess of the d'urbervilles uh, <laughs> where tess has got the illegitimate baby but has to go out and work and puts the baby down at the end of the road goes and suckles the baby baby goes back to sleep again carries on working mm-hmm. well like kind of going yeah okay you you know obviously the whole point about the medieval economy at harvest is that everybody goes out and works in the field you know, yeah. every hour God sends because you're terrified the rain's going to come down and you're going to lose the crop. Yeah. So there are going to be a lot of babies, you know, under minimal standards of care. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of going, but yeah, look, hang on, if I, you know, could I feel that I wish to put a baby down? 
even now in the middle of a field. I would have other concerns about apart from fairies. Mm. Uh, and this is in the 12th century when there are still English wolves. Yeah. In fact, one of the bizarre things, you know, we're talking about danger, is the actual animal danger in the countryside. You know, there are wolves, there are wild dogs, even, you know, livestock. Nobody actually flags any of that. You know, like their first concern, you get this, you know, the first concern of five-year-olds lost in the fields. It's not that something animate is going to attack them. It's that they are going to be at risk from the supernatural. Yeah. Could, could they have hung a could they have hung a crib from a tree? Would they do something like that? That's yeah, where I'm going a, in my mind. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, that's a good mother. As a mother, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's open field, so there are no trees. Mm. You're, you're, again, this is this is what I mean. The, the whole living there thing, you know, yeah. you you automatically impose a, an English hedged landscape. Yes, this is it. And of course, on, the, on the, rolling plains. The the clue is in the name of wool yeah. pit because of yeah. course it's named after wolf pits, yeah, exactly. which is there would yeah. have been yeah. a wolf pit. Yeah, which, which William yeah. translates because William is, is is telling the story actually for posterity much more than Ralph is. Ralph is just kind of going, oh, it's an interesting story. Some of the people mm. in my life know about it. You yeah. know, well, you know, William bothers to explain to you there is the county called Suffolk, it's you know, in eastern England and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So two different places, but just yeah. saying, obviously, because it, we're talking about the same time period in England yeah. when there might have been, well, there would have been wolf pits, clearly, because there was one in yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's very, yeah, that that is a very good point. So you've got these conflicting um, ideas from from Malakin of where they've yeah. hailed from. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, 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 you know, either, in a sense, we go back to it being absolutely accurate, this is what she said, um, you know, it's not as if they didn't have the opportunity to sit down and take notes. You know, if he's talking in Latin to the priest, he'd be virtually taking dictation. Yeah. Um, or the alternative is, is, is that, you know, their attempt to put the story together is, is heading in, in two different directions. In, in the one case, you know, she is a classic changeling, and in, in, in the other, she is a fairy child. Oh, yes, and um, food which was left out lying around disappeared mysteriously. Mm. Uh, which again, you'll, you'll remember the um, the material in Lady Wilde's Irish Collectania, you know, where abducted women, um, which is I think a separate branch of narrative from the changelings, but it is you know overlaps with it, of course, in mm-hmm. lots of teeth, only survive because again they can't eat the food of the other world, so they have to come back to the house at night and and basically eat the scraps of anything that's left lying around. Yeah. And, and and there's a woman that says, you know, seven years I have had nothing but the cold potatoes left on dressing. Oh. Well, uh, the other thing to note, I guess, is that Malikin does sound like a trickster. Yes. And so <laughs> they're well, sending... Was she an entirely reliable source? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if that chaplain's, uh, if, he, if he did take anything down, if that could, that manuscript could be sitting in somebody's dusty oh, old yeah. collection somewhere. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, on kind of the, the wool pit and the genealogy, um, a man contacted me recently uh, and as a child he had seen a green hand come around the door of his bedroom and it had, you know, uh, frightened him. And he told his parents, and his parents were very sweet with him about it. Uh, but he has, he swears that he did see this green hand reaching around. On asking him about his ancestry, his family hailed from around that area. Oh, right. Which, so I'm going to look a bit more closely at this. But yeah, I mean, obviously, again, we'll never know because we never know if if this if this green girl yeah. went on to have children when she married the man from from Lynn later Kings Lynn, yeah. but. Uh, you know, yeah, you do wonder whether there are, and the family would have been told to keep that quiet anyway, because they wouldn't wanted, they wouldn't have wanted their lineage to have been uh, out in the open, because again, othering. Um, but uh, yeah, it is. And the interesting thing is, that, you know, when when we start doing mass DNA tests in in, in East Anglia, you know, shows how open a place it was to strangers. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You, know, you, 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 you suspect in a poor town, they'd almost have reached a point where they're going, oh, yeah, came from mysterious land, called St. Martin's land, I'm underneath the pit somewhere in the middle of the county. Yes, you know, meet my friend here, he's a Fleming. I know another bloke here, he's Ruth here, you know. Right. That, that chap over there, you see him in the corner. 
Uh, you know, yeah. he's actually from the other side of the Atlantic. They brought him back with him after a failed voyage to Greenland. <laughs> yeah, very much yeah. so. It was it was definitely a place where you did have. They were very used to to strangers mm. coming in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, very good. The fact that you've got stories where people are tending to arrive in threes that's something that comes up a lot or they've got to you know chant something you know three comes into it all the time whether they've got to say something three three times or do something three times did you manage to tie that to anything in 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 kind of where that where that may have come from in in medieval folklore or medieval beliefs i mean three is a magic number of course but (laughs) well i mean Dangerously, it, it takes you back to the Romano Celtic deity carvings. Ah, oh, uh, right. Yes. There are various things going on there. Um, okay, so let, let's play with that. One is that um, several of these carvings are not displaying people who appear in iconography anywhere else, like the Gaini Cupolati. Um, you know, Fra- Francis does, does flag this up a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. but, Quite after the godlings, yeah. Um, With the three fates, yes. Um, and there, there is oh, there's also an unusual tendency, probably going on all through this period, um, to, to have nouns which are singular and plural. I mean, puck, puck and the pucks is, is one of these. Mm. Cupid and the cupids, faunus and the fauns are taken over from classical antiquity. Generally speaking, when people you know conceive of the supernatural. Um, it's like, you know, it, it is both quite often an exemplary figure and multiple figures, depending on whether it's coming at people as one or many. Mm. And three, three is settled on, you know, as, as, as a medial brain. Right. But then again, you know, when you're doing the hard stuff, you look at um, Ava Poach's material, you know, from the Balkans, it, which is much, much closer to our medieval material. I mean, you know. You, again, you know, that, that rings some alarms for a folklorist who, who's like, you know, right. yeah, you know, somebody from Balkans may be politely protesting, you know, we, we, we are not, you know, your dustbin of memory, we are us. Nevertheless, um, I'm talking about people living close to the edge and so on. Mm-hmm. East of that line at which serfdom was, uh, you know, increased and not abolished, where, where a lot of what we think of as late medieval things didn't happen effectively till, till the Russian Revolution was exported, um, you are going to be able to talk about folk material where the same social circumstances may have persisted and therefore the same supernatural may have persisted. You know, certainly her, her risks from falling asleep at noon, you know, um, the risk of being attacked by the other world is much more familiar than in the stuff we've got here. And the bit that frightens me as a researcher, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating, you know, not the reviews today, but the reviews later, you know, why did we not go out and do more work on gin? Because everybody I speak to who is, is coming from the Islamic world kind of goes, well, yeah, yeah, you know, we've heard all of that. You know, Bloke Blo told me only the other day it happened to his cousin. Right. Embarrassingly, yeah. even while we're attempting to have, have a quiet dinner, I think we were... Um, have, having the Folklore Society annual get-together. Oh, yeah. Uh, Worcester. Um, and we all went out for a curry. And it's the bits where you explain to people, you know, oh, you know, a bunch of friends who get together and talk about stories. And he sort of leans on the table and goes, you don't want to talk about a load of stories. You need to talk to my mother. She knows everything about gins. <laughs> like, okay. Brilliant. <laughs> well, you know, scrape the pop of them, so I'm going to do some more oral history. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, do you think you will be writing more more books uh, like this, but in, you know, looking kind of further afield? Do you think, have you got some plans? I think I would love to work with more people, and this is why Simon's yeah. book on social fairies is actually good being European-wide. Yeah, that's great. I think you have to start from where you are. I'm, you know, probably in one sense, almost anything is worth it to open up the field. Mm. Um, but the other is you have to know your ground. Mm. Um, that I takes did, years. <laughs> yes, it does. And, and you know, again, to work with, with you know, a history of the medieval, mm. I you know, have no doubt that if we were to actually mine down into the Scandinavian material, I mean, yeah. the two books that are needed um, mm-hmm. are an accessible volume which actually works on the relationship between the, um, the Scandinavian collectania, which are all accessible, 
and the earlier material. Mm -hmm. One of the differences is that um, we have lots of saints, um, surprisingly large number of native English saints. Of course, the more native they were, the more they started to look like fairies from the point of view of the indignant reformers. You know, even in the Middle Ages, you've got a lot of people kind of going, yep, okay, she's a wonderful lady and she has helped you out. Have we got any textual reference to this so-called saint of yours? Which takes you back to your um, wells and trees and, and lighting candles in lonely mm. places. Because, of course, half the time it looks pagan and the other half of the time it's happening. And 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 um, you, you've got the um, Lawrence of Oxford, um, where the bishop essentially goes down on what, to all intents and purposes, looks you know like a new saint cult. Finds out that he was a, a hanged man. Clearly, his relatives thought that he ought not to have been hanged, which made him into a martyr. The court, however, took a different view on the matter. Uh, and of course, you know the bishop's version is he's not a saint; he's a very naughty boy. Yeah. <laughs> Will you stop venerating? <laughs> Put yeah. those candles out. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, that's yeah, classic example in that case. Then, but yes. uh, but it it is frustrating uh, to see that kind of happening century after century. This all gets it, it, my it, goat. Well, People being told how to worship. I mean, the paradox here is that one of our best stories, the, the um, you know, uh, the, the the fawn and the girl. You know, I, I love the way the fawn appears in her bedroom. You know. She, she asserts her virginity so quite quite strongly, pointing out that you know, um, and he, and and he offers her you know, jewel you know, bangles, bracelets, earrings, golden trinkets, and other things that girls like. Mm. And I was thinking, oh, happy days, spooky, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, before they invented chocolates and flowers, yeah, yeah. Um, well, but, that, that, um, that, that's the other that, thing. That's, that's in the miracles of St William of Norwich. Um, and William of Norwich, who of course is a, a saint created basically for anti-Semitic purposes, um, only makes his way into a miracle collection because, you know, the initial view of the bishop, which was basically, we're well, sorry about him, he's a dead lad, we don't know who killed him, we need to stop making such a fuss about him, it's actually upsetting my relationship with the Jewish community of Norwich. Mm. You know, ultimately the tussle goes the other way. So you, you've got a cult there that becomes a fiction and has its own little miracle book, uh, which, of course, is commissioned from, from everybody that um, Tom, Thomas knows. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, Scandinavia has got Olaf. You know, there are very few saints. One of the interesting things is by the time the conversion to Scandinavia happened, there was a much stronger control over the generation of local saints. Um, so whereas the position in Anglo-Saxon England was close to Wales and Cornwall, you know, almost everybody, you know, potentially the founder of the church received, you know, honours at a very local level that might suddenly make it big if somebody believed in them. Mm. Uh, you've only got two or three making the grave in Scandinavia, and therefore what you haven't got is you haven't got big miracle shrines. And also, you know, it's at the end rather than the beginning of a journey. Whereas if we were looking at the major cult centres, and also the later Marian cult centres in France, mm -hmm. which are on mm -hmm. the pilgrimage routes, all of which are competing with each other, because they actually have to be able to work more miracles than the shrine down the road. Yeah, that's right. That's the point at which we would have big collections, which in many cases have not been published yet. Mm. It is a case of combing through it. Yeah. You, know, you, you have to read hundreds of these things. I, you, I, I you, would you, you end up like somebody in A and E. It's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> right, sorry, another blind man miraculously cured. Get out of my way. <laughs> it's yeah, like, have a supernatural story, please. I, I can't. Th I, I just think that would be the most wonderful thing to do. And I'm mm. thinking it now, but it's always been a dream of mine just to be able to sit there and go through all of this material where a lot of it was in latin how did you cope with all of that then so you were fairly fairly kind of oh, yes yes and a, a, a lot of it is you know it, it, it's, it's it, you know it's like talking to people in third language in a pub you yeah. know yeah. it's yeah. um you know the, the the two of you are using fairly simple style so you can understand what each other is saying piece by piece. yeah, yeah. One, one or two people i i take my hat off to reginald the Durham, who really is quite a stylist you know it's, yeah. it's lovely because the, the editor in about 1810 obviously wants to be rude about him because like he's in 1810 and he's writing about a monk but he has to say okay yeah we believe a lot of weird stuff but by god he could describe a storm well 
Well, this is it. And I think that the whole of the book is filled with this kind of wit and this way that you're able to, you know, to look at these stories and to even the, and to look at the people that were writing them too. It's, as I say, a very entertaining and informative book, one which I'm very glad has, has been written. And so thank you for you know all the work you're con continuing to do in this area. And I look forward to more. Are you going to be taking taking this out on the road and, and talking at any kind of upcoming events? Um, I will be talking um, online for the Folklore Society um, oh, 8th of October. Wonderful. So after, after that, you know, I am my own agent. Make excellent well yeah i will definitely be tuning in mm. for that those seminars are always brilliant anyway the folklore society one so i'll i'll flag up the link there so people can can join and where can they get hold of your book university of express have got their own website it's the best place uh, to get it it. It, is, it is an academic book but chunks of it are going to become available which i think is also the opportunity people need yeah, and I think if it is a pretty hefty, they've it's a pretty hefty price as well, which is really uh, hard for people. Quite worth saying that, yes, I, I think that um, bits of it are, are probably going to become available because that's yeah. the ordinary routine now. So you can get a sense of what it what it's about. Yeah, no, that's great. And if people come to hear you speak or tune in to the folklore. Mm -hmm society then you know they'll be able to hear you there too but yeah thanks so much jeremy for coming and chatting with me and i hope to speak to you again sometime and um yeah all the best with with the you know this new newly released book and i look forward to other people being able to get their hands on it too Bye.